uporaba konop i u medicinske svrhe se koristi i mogu se štete. Evo da vas ja isto bolje vidim, hvala što ste došli. Vaš ovo izlaganje je vrlo simpatično. Odakle na razmišljenje koliko ima čudesnih tih biljaka u našem ekosustavu, na ovoj čudesnoj planeti. Ako ih stavite u fokus, koju priču možete napraviti od njih. Možda ovaj zadnji dio, kad maknemo korist te biljke u industriji, poljoprivredi i tako dalje, ovaj dio koji je na neki način asocijirao na pomoć ili lijeka, a ljudi i na domaša neke surove medicine su tražili razne načine da si olakšaju patnje. Pa vidite kako je i ta biljka, za koju mnogi nisu znali da neke alternative te biljke imaju čudesa djelovanja na mozgove, što se u nekim drugim kulturama u to vrijeme daleko ranije otkrilo. Ja vidim da Africi nisu radili štrikove od konopne, nego su duvali pravu travu i osjetili sve blagodati toga djelovanja. Ovdje su zagrci, međutim se skoro ubesili sa konopnjom i su se znali kako ona može djelovati. Sad neće vam biti sve simpatično, ovako što ja sad ovako godo kažem. Uglavnom, sigurno, kad već idemo o te biljke, postoje se pitanje da li doista nema medicinske konoplje. Pa se postoje konoplja koja se može, ili njezine dijelovi, ili sastojci, sastavci, tvari, što god, možete koristiti u medicinske svrhe uz očekivanje da će to djelovati ljekovito ili kao neko pomoćno ljekovito sredstvo, odnosno to su najčešće sredstva koja ne liječe bolest. There's a wealth of laboratory evidence that these anti-tumor properties kill cancer cells in a variety of ways. There are multiple mechanisms of action identified by which cannabis kills cancer cells. And they're divided into various categories. And among these are anti-proliferative effects. Normally, that's, that's one of the hallmarks of a cancer cell is that it just keeps reproducing. So if you stop the reproduction, that's an anti-proliferative effect. There are anti-angiogenesis effects, and this means that the cannabinoids will stop the tumor from being able to elaborate or grow new blood vessels to support the growth of the tumor. There are anti-metastatic effects, and that is simple enough to mean that the cannabinoids block the ability of the cancer cells to spread into other tissues. And there's another uh, effect that has a wild name, apoptotic effect. Apoptosis refers to the ability of cannabinoids to speed the death of the abnormal cells. And that's something that is, is especially important in cancer because you're, you're able to hasten the death of the cell without disturbing the normal cells around it. Seth Research Laboratories in California have recently demonstrated that in some tumors, cancer cells are killed by marijuana, while the other healthy cells are left untouched. Cells that stop moving and become still white dots are dead cancer cells. The ability of cannabinoids to kill bad cells while protecting healthy ones is particularly important when we're talking about brain cancer because of the so-called blood-brain barrier. The brain has to be sheltered from outside influences that might hitch a ride on the bloodstream and cause havoc. 
What is exciting and unique about cannabinoids is that they can pass through the blood-brain barrier because of their slippery, fat-loving nature. Cannabinoids get right into the brain's cancer cells by moving easily through the cell's membranes, which are also composed of lipids. The evidence is piling up in mice-infested labs that the endocannabinoid system, when stimulated by cannabinoids, has an anti-tumor effect and can instruct cancer cells to commit suicide. Ali umnožavaju simptome ili patnju ljudi koji boluju od neke bolesti, često ozbiljne bolesti. Vezano s to bila mi asocijacija na jedan čudesni lijek, lijek koji je apsolutno preplavio Evropu, one koji su mogli doći do toga lijeka. Taj lijek je u promen stavio tinktura Paracelsus, Theophrastus, Bombastus, Paracelsus von Hohenheim. Dakle, nevjerojatno, dakle, dobio je sve moguće titule, jer je nešto što je u svijetu određeno civilizaciji i kulturi bilo davno poznato, opium, dakle, čudesan sok maka, maka gdje smo opet nijeli makovnjače, a negdje su ušli opium ili gutali opium, pa liječili proljeve, otlanjali bolove itd. On je skužio čudotvornu moć opijuma i napravio tinkturu koju je u tim farmakopejama na neki način prezentirao i nazvao lijek Laudanum. Laudanum je liječio sve. Svima kojima nešto nije bilo dobro, kad su uzeli opijuma, bilo im je bolje. E sad, da li se išta liječio, nije liječilo, to je drugo pitanje. Ali lijek je bio čudotvoran. Sigurno je najviše pomagao od kod djece od dizenterije i proljeva, jer je strećavao naprosto gubina tekuće i dehidraciju i tim je omogućio čuvanje toga resursa, što je sigurno umanjilo smrtnost, dakle bio je sigurno koristan. Kad već idemo per analogijam govoriti o opijumu kao čudesnom lijeku, pa vidjeti što je danas od toga ostalo, možemo reći da su ostala dva alkaloida te nevjerojatno rašire biljke, morfi, i kodein. Mali papaveri, možda treći od 26 alkaloida opijuma, se koriste u medicini. Da kako čisti, prirađeni, očišćeni. Međutim, pojava morfi u medicini i istraživanje vezano u usto su vrlo brzo dovela do još jednog čudotvornje i lijeka. Neću reći koji laboratoriju su napravili diacetilnu formu morfija i proizvali lijek za liječenje ovisnih o morfiju. Kako se zove taj lijek? Tada i kako se zva? Diacetilmorfin. Heroin. Doktori farmaceuti koji su pacijente liječili sa morfijem u terapiji boli, su probali, iskušavali, vrag im nije dao mira, pa im je dobro bilo. I naudili se na morfiju. Ja sam u ovoj praksi, pogotovo početnih godina moga rada, počeo sam raditi kao liječnik 71. godine i odradio sam 42. godine radnog vrštaža i tako sad sam već kao stavio doktor u mirovini jedno dvije godine. Tada sam imao dosta liječnika, se stara medicinskih farmaceuta koji su također bili ovisni u morfiju, a neki su se kasnije pogledali i heroinom. Jasno, vrlo brzo se skužilo da jest svi koji su dobili heroin nisu više trebali morfiju ali je bio problem kako je skinuti sa heroina. I sam se poslom dakle bavio najvećoj vjeri ih nekih, recimo, ajde, s heroinskim, ajde, jedno 35 godina. Na tisuće su mi prošli kroz život. Među njima da kako, da mi je prošlo i više stotina onih koji su stvarno ovisni o kanabisu. Znači, o jednoj od tih tvari u toj biljici, delta 9 tetra hidrokanaminol. Addiction to drugs like heroin, nicotine, which is in tobacco, um, and even caffeine, which is in coffee, are far stronger on a chemical, physiological level than anything that we've been able to document with um, withdrawal from the use of, of marijuana. The 
the classic addiction that we imagine is uh, addiction to opiates or you know injection drugs like heroin. You imagine the cravings. You imagine the you get so sick if you don't have the medicine or the drug. Uh, you go through chills. Your nose starts to run. Your eyes water. Uh, you're sick to your stomach. You're vomiting. Diarrhea. That's all. That's called um, a withdrawal syndrome. And then there's something called tolerance. And that's where you need more of the drug to achieve the same effect. Uh, and then there's the addiction, the psychological compulsion. You're orienting your whole life around trying to find and procure this. At the, and and uh, your personal, your social, your functioning uh, suffers as a result. That is, our, I think, our model of addiction. And then depending on how socially available the substance is, like, for example, tobacco is available everywhere, so people uh, will very rarely experience all these crave, uh, withdrawal syndromes versus if it's your drug of addictive choice is uh, an opioid that's hard to get, you'll see varying degrees of behavior uh, on the spectrum. But when it comes to marijuana, the We've tried to look for withdrawal syndromes. They talk about mild sleep changes for people who've been using it heavily and then stop using it. Uh, EEG disturbances, little change in your brainwave pattern, uh, a little bit of difficulty sleeping, a little bit of anxiety, reduced mood, uh, and that's uh, which kind of dissipates over over time. Uh, not that same uh, all of a sudden change in your physiology where you're extremely sick and can't function and. Um, the, uh, also, there's no uh, life-threatening nature whatsoever like there is when you withdraw from Valium or, or benzodiazepines, which can actually, the withdrawal can kill you. And the same thing with alcohol, the withdrawal can kill you. No, nothing like that with marijuana. The main thing there is a, a, the, the behavioral and social conditions that set, would set up a compulsive use pattern, prohibiting it, uh, doing things on the sly. It turns out some people psychologically do report improved psychological function using this substance. Um, and as you would expect, because the compounds have been shown to have antidepressive qualities, anti-anxiety properties. So it's possible when people are, are no longer using it abruptly that they revert to a state that might have previously been their uh, prior state, which was more depressed and more anxious. So that's always something to figure, consider as well if you're wondering if, if, if a substance is a withdrawal syndrome or really just a withdrawal of, a sub, of an agent that was helping improve the psychological functioning. So the bottom line is uh, there have been studies done. Uh, they try to find what percentage of users of marijuana become addicted, and that they, they quote this figure 9% the Institute of Medicine does, but those are based on surveys where you have to answer questions like, do you spend a lot of time looking for this substance? Uh, you know, have you, have you faced legal problems uh, when, because of your use? And a lot of those answers might be more related to the, the just the social phenomenon of, of um, you know, really trying to, to stamp out the use of marijuana rather than any actual um, chemical or physiological dependence or addiction on the drug. <laughs> nekoliko stotina ih je bilo. Ne, ja ću svoje, a bit će diskusija, ja sam potpuno otvoren za raspravu. Dakle, nisam pridurio diskriminaciji marihuane, pa čak i kad je reč o droge. Naša kultura je to, kultura neka je ono drugo, oni diskriminaju alkohol, znate kako to već izgleda. Negdje, svijet je podijel na razne načine, pa podijeljenje odnosu na substance ili droga, ako baš hoćete, koje se konzumira i koje su sastavnica određene kulture ili integrirani u život. Vezano uz marihuanu kao lijek, ta biljka je ponovo došla na neki način, nevjerojatan fokus. Zašto se to dogodilo? Koja je pozdjena toga sve, koje će biti posljedice, to ćemo, to ćemo vidjeti u nekoj perspektivi. The new year is barely underway, and already the kitchen at Dixie Elixirs is buzzing. Food products like Dixie Rolls, white chocolate peppermint, and truffles, all containing marijuana, roll off the assembly line. This edibles manufacturer is picking up where a momentous 2014 in Colorado left off. The best thing that happened is the sky didn't fall. Uh, we didn't have mass chaos. Everyone was very 
uh, controlled and, and responsible with their consumption. But that's not to say the first year of recreational marijuana sales in this state went smoothly. It was, uh, it was a wild ride, to, to say the least. I think it's been a success with conditions. Joel Warner, a writer who covers the pot beat, says it was a lucrative year. 2014 recreational marijuana sales could approach $400 million. A chunk of that money will go to schools. This business has also helped fire up other sectors in Colorado's economy. Our real estate is booming right now, 5 million square feet of commercial uh, uh, lease space. That's the estimates that we're seeing that this industry has had. You know, imagine if that was vacant property and what that does for an economy. There are now hundreds of marijuana dispensaries in the state. And as you see on this map, there's a thick cluster of them in the city that's led the way on revenues, Denver. <laughs> but go beyond money. Some say marijuana you eat, called edibles, and their lack of clearly marked portions led some users to overdo it, making them sick. Critics say edibles remain a weak link in the marijuana experiment. These uh, bud tenders say, Take one tiny piece, take one tenth of this candy bar and wait two hours. Who takes a tenth of a candy bar and waits two hours? I think it is safe to say that edibles certainly were a flashpoint this year. One critic of marijuana thinks many Coloradans already regret voting for a system he believes will lead to negative health effects and more addiction in the future. The societal costs are far greater. The industry themselves get wealthy. They make a lot of money, but the burden falls on families falls on employers, falls on our health care system, falls on our schools. I think absolutely in Colorado there is buyer's remorse. I don't think we've seen large public backlash. Warner worries that more frequent smokers, who he says drive the industry, will demand more potent marijuana. But he and many others are convinced the recreational marijuana industry, still a work in progress, is here to stay. I don't see the genie going back in the bottle. There's too much infrastructure, too much uh, momentum has been put in place. Hendrick Sabrandi, CCTV, Denver. A recimo, danas zove jedna gospođa telefon, moja žena diže slušalicu, opet te kaže neka zove. Da kada je pusti neka, pitaj, svaku ženu pitaj ko je, što je, tako, onda tek daje ovakvu neku atribuciju koja može izgledati malo čudno. I onda ja i se javam, moja mama ima rak, dojke, operirana je, kemoterapija, ljevo, desno, mi bi htjeli pomoći, nama su dali vaš telefon preko prijatelja, prijatelja, prijatelja i fino. Jer vi pišete recepte za te ljekove da mi to možemo normalno kupiti. Ja kažem, ja ne pišem recepte, pogotovo se nemaju liječenje karcinoma, znači nema govora. I ja upitujem pristojno gospođu da pače kaže, uputim ju na neke procedure, moguće, ajde, Evropskoj uniji, što se može napraviti, pa ona doista vjeruje da bi to mame pomoglo i smanjio riziko širenja bolesti nakon neko vremena. Juče zove gospodin za svoju supru, isto tako. Prošli tjedan, dva mladića da sam liječio radi heroinske ovisnosti, on je počeo svoj blagotvorni put prema heroinu sa duvanjem trave. And, and marijuana, the U.S. government still classifies marijuana in the same category as LSD and heroin. And those are defined as drugs with, quote, no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Do you think that's just not true? That, that is not true. I mean, They're not a high potential for abuse and, and legitimate medical reasons. Cocaine is a Schedule II substance. It has a higher potential for abuse. It right. is more, you're more likely to become addicted to it, almost twice as likely to become addicted to it. Uh, there are many substances out there, some of which are legal, that you're more likely to, to, to abuse than marijuana. It's, just, it's, not, it's not even close to being the truth with regard to abuse. With regard to medical applications, you saw, again, you know, an example of that. But again, I don't want you to think this is anecdotal. That's mm -hmm. been part of the problem with this debate is people rely on conjecture, hyperbole, and anecdotal stories. There is real science here. So Charlotte is one girl, but she, she represents lots of patients who have problems for which marijuana has really worked for them. So it definitely has medical applications. And let me just share with you, Anderson, this wasn't in the documentary, but the United States government, through its Department of Health and Human Services, holds a patent on marijuana as a protectant for the brain. 
Yeah, it's something to protect the brain after a head injury. How, how is that possible that the they, U.S. government holds a patent? The U.S. government holds a patent on one hand, and on the other hand, same government says it has no medical applications. So it, it's, I mean, you know, I, totally I, I've hypocritical. Said to this, I, I think I've said this to you before, but journalists, I think, are trained to hate hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy. Uh, it, it just, I, I've never seen it quite like this. The, um, you interviewed the director of the National Institute on Drug, Drug Abuse for the documentary. She told USA Today something. She said that, that if she was concerned that if the drug became universally legal, that adolescents would have more access to the drug. And that's something you hear from a lot of parents and, and uh, people who, who work in the drug field who say it's kind of a gateway drug. Well, you know, first of all, I don't think it's a gateway drug. I mean, t to the extent that that implies that your body somehow changes and that you now crave other drugs as a result of trying marijuana, I don't think that's true. I mean, the science doesn't back that up. People who get marijuana illicitly are often coming in contact in situations where they're then exposed to other drugs, and that may explain in part why they uh, go on to heroin or cocaine or something like that. But with regard to adolescence, look, of course, I I'm worried about that as well. I think any responsible doctor, any responsible parent, anybody, would be worried about that. I don't want kids taking this stuff. I don't want anybody whose brain hasn't fully developed, which you know usually is the mid-20s, taking this stuff. That's not about this. But the trade-off shouldn't be, because of those concerns, we will then deny people therapy that may be the only therapy that works for them. I don't think that's, that's the trade-off. And I don't think even Nora Volkov, who's the head of NIDA, would think that that would be a good idea. Hey. Zima The claim. There already exists a legalized form of medical marijuana. It's called Marinol. False. The facts. Marinol is not a legalized form of marijuana. It is a synthetic, contains only one of 60 plus active components of marijuana, and is inferior to medical marijuana in a number of ways. The proof. A clinical trial of marijuana published online April 11, 2008 by the Journal of Pain noted, when taken alone, 9-THC or dronabinol does not fully replicate the effect of the total cannabis preparation. Further, in a double-blind, placebo-based study published June 21, 2007 in the Journal of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndromes, 
Researchers from Columbia University found that it took doses of Marinol ranging from four to eight times the recommended dose to achieve almost the same results as the low-grade marijuana provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Even at this elevated dose, Marinol was outperformed by natural marijuana on some measures. Finally, Marinol is also far too intoxicating for some patients. The American College of Physicians has noted that Marinol's psychoactive side effects are more severe than those of inhaled marijuana. To learn more about the facts regarding medical marijuana, please visit minnesotacares.org. A da se isto ono spriječi ovo ilegalno tržište na koje se zapravo ne zna tko što, tko što prodaje. Ja vam neću reći koje su još bile refleksije ili posljedice ljudi koji su uzimali te čudne pripravke kupljene na crnom tržištu i koje su mentalne posljedice. Ako čitate knjigu o najbolju knjigu koju je izdao Cambridge prije kratkog vremena, košta 60 funti, ako se ošte kupiti nije nikakav problem, Tamo su svi radovi analizirani, pogotovo kohren baze, koje se bave zapravo prezentacijom rezultata dominantno. Neće još što možemo govoriti o evidence-based medicini, gdje su provjerena vrlo stroga i kontrolirana istraživanja dala odgovore na pitanja da li je nešto istinski korisno ili gdje je omir između koristi štete takav da se određeno sredstvo ili lijek u ovom slučaju nešto što se nalazi u biljci kanabis isplati uzimati. I što kažem nešto o tom pitanju i kako mi to kanimo izregulirati, da kažem nešto zbog kojeg razloga je marihuana u našoj kulturi ili ovoj nekoj zapadnjačkoj kulturi generalno kao pika pa čak i cijeno platila i ovaj konoplja. Ja sam u Slavoni rođen pa konoplje je bilo zdravo, sam tamo nekad kretao se živio i tvoja. te konoplje je bilo i sjećam se ovih obreda i tradicija nekih tamo 50. godina i koliko mi je moja svijest dobro, dobro tamo vraća u tu prošlost i to je sve nestalo zbog čega. Ima tu nekih drugih pozadinskih razloga vezano uz tekstil, uz tekstila, sintetiku i sve ono što se dogodilo, ali u svakom slučaju od 60-ih godina kad je došlo do na neki način prodora, dakle tradic, ove, ove, da ne kažem, e, hipi kulture i konzumacije određenih droga, netradicionalnih droga za, za, za naše podneblje, ja sam da Prva substanca, dakle, i najraširenija je bila i ostala upravo marihuana. Ona je došla na listu, sukladno, dakle, ono što su političari u okrivi naroda stavili, i su konvencije propisale mehanizme kontrole, nadzora i tako dalje, od 61. godine, pa 71. godine konvencije i tako dalje. Znači, marihuana je sada na listu droga, kontrolirane tvari, uz obavez države, da učine sve što je njihove moći i što je potrebno da se dostupnost tih droga koliko je moguće dakle, reducira. The history of marijuana in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. 5,000 years ago, the Chinese emperor Shenang used marijuana. He wrote about its medicinal values. It helped gout, malaria, and rheumatism. Ironically, it was also a cure for absent-mindedness. Over the millennia, use of weed spread to the Indians, dots not feathers, who used it recreationally. Europeans were smoking the herb by 500 AD. The Muslims also liked to get stoned. The Quran bans the use of alcohol, so they created hashish, its use spreading through Persia and North Africa in the 12th century. Thanks to the Spanish, marijuana crossed the Atlantic in 1545, Olay. The English brought weed to Jamestown in 1611, where it became alongside tobacco a commercial crop. Its fibers used for rope, cloth, and paper. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were both marijuana farmers. 
Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence on paper made from the plan. The first American flag was woven from marijuana fibers. God bless America. Between 1850 and 1942, marijuana was listed in the United States Pharmacopoeia. And just as Emperor Shenong had realized almost 5,000 years earlier, it could be used to help with rheumatism along with relieving nausea and labor pains. During this time, cotton overtook marijuana as the major cash crop in the southern United States. In 1910, the Mexican Revolution brought many immigrants to the United States. They brought with them recreational marijuana use. Anti-immigrant sentiment sparked the first legal attacks against marijuana. And in 1913, California became the first state to make pot illegal. In the Roaring Twenties, cannabis really hit its recreational stride. Jazz musicians and showbiz types were the main users, spreading its use through clubs called tea pads sprouting up in cities around the country. These clubs were not initially considered a threat as patrons caused no problems in the community and the drug wasn't illegal. This soon changed as racism again raised its ugly head. The white establishment believed that marijuana was causing white girls to sleep with black men and breaking down the social order. By the 1930s, the U.S. Federal Bureau of Narcotics claimed marijuana was addictive and that it was a gateway to stronger narcotics. In 1936, the infamous and now cult movie Reefer Madness was released, financed by a church group. Who else? The movie claimed smoking marijuana would lead to manslaughter, suicide, rape, and insanity. By the 1950s, marijuana became part of American high culture, with beat generation writers and tokers like William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, and Allen Ginsberg forming the vanguard. The 1960s saw marijuana break on through to the new countercultural mainstream, smoked by hippies, dropouts, war protesters, students, and the Beatles. It became an enduring symbol of rebellion against conformity and authority. Insanity took hold of the U.S. Congress in 1970 when they passed the Controlled Substance Act the law that classified heroin, LSD, and marijuana as Schedule I drugs. In 1975, the Mexican government destroyed the entirety of its country's marijuana crop. Colombia became the main weed supplier to the U.S., and the drug cartels were born. During the Reagan-Bush years, the war on drugs created a zero-tolerance policy for marijuana use. Mandatory sentencing for possession explodes the prison population. Millions of young men, mostly black and Hispanic, are incarcerated for nonviolent drug-related crimes. The prison industrial complex rises. Today, the United States has 25% of the world's prison population and incarcerates more of its citizens than any country in the world. In 1993, Bill Clinton becomes president of the United States. He admits to having used marijuana. During the 90s, marijuana use comes back into fashion. In 1996, California becomes the first state to legalize medical marijuana. Alaska, Oregon, and Washington follow suit in 98. Maine does the same in 99, as do Nevada, Colorado, and Hawaii in 2000. In 2001, George W. Bush is given the presidency of the United States. He also admits to using marijuana. During W's presidency, Montana, New Mexico, Michigan, Vermont, and Rhode Island legalized medical marijuana. Marijuana goes mainstream. World-class athletes, business people, politicians, and entertainers all come out of the marijuana closet. The stigma fading. In 2009, Barack Obama becomes president. That guy admitted to smoking a lot of weed. Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, and D.C. all make medical marijuana legal during the Obama presidency. In 2012, Washington and Colorado become the first states to legalize recreational marijuana use. In 2014, Florida goes to the polls on November 4th. What happens next is up to us. Tri legalni masu, legalni drug, koji uzmete psijakte za lijekove, znači uz alkohol i nikotin, pojavila u jednom tako obivnom smislu i sama rihvala. Kad sam počeo raditi, dakle, s početkom, dakle, 71. godine, većina pacijenata koji su dolazili ambulantno čudo su bili praktički konzumenti marihuane hašiša. Pa se to nisu bile bebe tih godina. To su bili ljudi koji su prošli i Afganistan, i Pakistan, Dakle, Koranšar, i Goli u Indiju i tako dalje. Dakle, oni su sve to prošli i oni su, znači, nekad su došli, ono, da se nisu kupali desecima, nisu uopće uši imali od prašine koja je bila i onog, one masti uvo, nisu ni čuli više ništa. Pa smo nekad čistili uha ta dva, tri dana na otorini, da uopće mogu išta čuti nekada. Znači, bili su teži konzumenti tih droga, odnosno tih droga, marihovane i kanabise. I bili su, mnogi od njih su, da kako bili hospitalizirani, tek kad su došli u stanje popune mentalne disfunkcije. Reći vam samo nekoliko riječi vezano uz razloge zbog čega je marihuana kontrolirana tvar i zbog čega ne bi bilo dobro, kad je riječ o javnom zdravstvenom interesu i zaštiti djece i mladi, da se osigura i poveća dostupnost marihuane. Moje 
na neki način orijentacija bila kao javnost zdravstvenog stručnjaka, da učinimo sve da se smanje ponuda i potrošnja i alkohola, i nikotina, i psijoaktivne lijekova u nemedicinske svrhe, osobito kad je riječ o djeci i mladeža. Ovo sve druga kad je riječ o odnosima, koja su ti mama mogućiti, da li olakšati, na koji način, kako konkurirati ilegalno u tržištu, u zadnje vrijeme ilegalno u tržištu sintetiđi kanabinoida, za koje ne znamo na koji način mogu zapravo zaprijeti. Ali recimo samo dvije, tri činice medicinske, ja samo govorim kao liječnik, kao psihijatar, ono što sam radio i ono što kaže najbolja literatura. Dakle, kad je riječ o kanabisu kao drogi, ajde samo nekoliko činica. Prvo, adiktivnost samo kanabisa nije visoka. Puno su adiktivne, brojne droge, marihuana je dolje dosta, dosta, dosta dosta nisko po adiktivnosti. Odnosno po potencijalu da se osoba navuče ili fizički, osobito fizički, psihički i da jednostavno dođe u stanje kad teško kontrole svoj poriv za dalje uzimanje sredstva unatoč toga što ima možda ne toga ozbiljne štetne posljedice. Podaci u literaturi su pokazali da je adiktivnost parihole slična adiktivnosti alkohola, ali ispod adiktivnosti nikotina. Odnosno da će 9% vikend konzumenata ako to nastaje raditi kroz dvije, tri godine u kontinuitetu, postati ovisno od kanabisa. Percepcija sami konzumena, 9%, dakle, ne oni rekreativci koji podoba joint jedan, dva mjesečno ili godišnje, ne znam šta. Govorimo onima koji to na tjednoj bazi konzumiraju kroz duže vrijeme, znači 9% osoba u prosjeku će doći u stanje da zadovoljaju kriterije da dobi diagnozu F12.2, dakle, ovisnost o kanabisu. Hello. Hello, Dr. Bob. Yes, sir. Come on in. Brian. Brian. How are you doing, man? Good. Our endocannabinoid system regulates everything in our body. Our immune system, digestive system, cardiovascular system, nervous system, endocrine system, skin, skeleton, everything in our body is homeostatically regulated by our endocannabinoid system. And yet it's not taught in medical school? You know, there's something a little flawed here. <laughs> Even if you've never smoked a joint in your life, you have sort of internal cannabis in your body. You have an endocannabinoid system. Endo meaning inside. You've got cannabinoid receptors in your brain and in your liver and your spleen and your bladder and your immune system cells. You've got receptors all over your body for this plant. And so when you smoke, you're sort of stimulating and working within the endocannabinoid system and you're stimulating your cannabinoid receptors. That helps to regulate your immune system, your energy, your metabolism, your blood sugar. It sort of tamps down inflammation. Your endocannabinoid system does a lot to maintain homeostasis in your body. So there's at least two types of cannabinoid receptors that we know about so far. There's CB1 and CB2. So the CB1 receptors are located all over your brain and it's actually the most plentiful G-coupled receptor in your brain. Although there aren't any in your brain stem, which means that you can't overdose from cannabis, it won't stop you from breathing, the way that you could say overdose from pain medicines. Just today an article came out describing how um, the endocannabinoid system was modulating the synapses of glutaminergic and gamma neurons in our brain and how certain mutations in some of the involved proteins forming synapses in the brain are modified in people with autism. So we see a link between autism and the endocannabinoid system and that's been pioneered by a woman in California, Miko Hester Perez, who has a severely autistic son. And in desperation, she got a permit for him and gave him cannabis, and it changed everything. So today, after she's been doing this for a few years, we now have a scientific validation. When people ask me, like, so what's the most important thing you learned? By far, the most important thing I learned was that THC and CBD can kill cancer cells, that they can kill cancer cells while leaving healthy cells intact. They trigger a programmed cell death, which is called apoptosis. And not only do they trigger apoptosis, but they prevent the cancer cells from being invasive, from metastasizing. They prevent the, a growing tumor from signaling that it needs more blood supply, which is called angiogenesis. So 
cannabinoids, not just as a treatment for nausea and decreased appetite that happens because of chemotherapy, but cannabinoids actually being chemotherapy, actually treating cancer. That's really exciting to me. You know, what's so interesting is the medical marijuana community is better educated than the doctors. And I think that uh, what we should all take home from that is that as you learn and understand this stuff, it means we have to make the changes. We have to interact with our government. We have to reshape how energy flows through them so that this phase change will occur. All of us have to participate in it. You know, we want to see the Berlin Wall fall. Zašto je percepcija konzumenata marihuane koji to duvaju redovito na dnevnoj bazi takva da nisu ovisni? To, to, to percepcija nastaje kao posljedica činice da se marihuana vrlo sporo i teško eliminira iz tijela. Until uh... Quite recently, actually, until the mid-60s, the active constituent was not known. We identified a compound, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which is the only one that causes these uh, changes. For many years, it was unknown whether these changes uh, are just a non-specific action of, of THC, but in the mid-80s, it was found that there is a receptor in the brain that uh, is acted upon by THC and starts a cascade of reactions which causes the changes that we identify as high. But how come that the brain has a receptor for a plant constituent? After all, uh, the, our brain doesn't have a receptor for every plant constituent, actually doesn't have a receptor for any plant constituent. So we started working on the assumption that maybe there are compounds in the brain that act on this particular receptor, and THC in the plant actually mimics the action of the compounds in the brain. Indeed, about 10, 15 years ago, we were uh, able to isolate two compounds. One we called anandamide, and the other is known as 2-AG, that stimulate that bind to this particular receptor and they start a cascade of reactions that we identify as high. Why do we have that system of receptor, endogenous cannabinoids? Why? I mean, just in order to cause high? No. This is a very important physiological system which is involved in a large number of uh, physiological reactions and in large number of therapeutic reactions. For example, anandamide and 2-AG are involved in neuroprotection. When we have a brain trauma, for example, the brain tries to reduce the damage by overproducing, if you wish, these compounds which lower the damage. Uh, they are also involved in anxiety. It is involved in sleep. It is involved in essentially all physiological reactions that have been investigated. Chances are that this particular system will uh, be the basis on which uh, a large number of drugs will be developed. At the moment, there is one major drug that has been introduced in Europe. A company produced an antagonist to the cannabinoid system and they use it in order to reduce the appetite and also to enhance metabolism of fats so that ultimately we see an effect on obesity, an effect on all these diseases that are associated with obesity. Many other companies are working on many different aspects of uh, cannabinoids, so for example inflammation, uh, neurological diseases, maybe Alzheimer, and I assume that within the next 10 years we shall have a whole array of new drugs as many companies are at present working on all these aspects.